So, I'd like to welcome all of you to the uh, 12th lecture of the course. What I will do is I will just, uh, we will start working out some of the problems and uh, things like that in the second half of today's lecture. I want to just wrap up a few things which I think uh, is necessary so that there is some clarity. The first thing I want to do is talk about the problem of the cylindrical surface and actually evaluate n dot t dot n so that you have a feel for how it looks, okay. So, what we want to do is we have the cylindrical surface like we had last time which is given by R equals f of z, okay. This is the cylindrical surface and like you saw last time what we do is we write this thing in an implicit form equal to 0 and the normal vector happens to be the gradient of f divided by the mod of the gradient of f which in this case will be E r minus f dash E z divided by square root of 1 plus f prime squared. Okay, this we saw last time. What I want to do is see when you are actually working out a problem, you need to evaluate the quantity n dot t dot n to get the normal stress. Okay, I just wrote it to you as that is the formula, but then when you are working on a cylindrical coordinates or when you are working in a problem in rectangular Cartesian coordinates, you need to be able to evaluate it. So, let us just do one case where we are actually doing the evaluation and since we have this pet problem of cylindrical surface, we will just use that uh, to illustrate. Okay. So, now our job is to evaluate n dot t dot n, find n dot t dot n for this problem, okay. So, n is, we have already found out what is n and in order to, since we are talking about a very specific problem, I am not going to talk in terms of indices i and j, I am going to talk in terms of r and z, okay. And t, remember, will be just a two dimensional uh, matrix, I can write it as tau r z, tau r r, tau r z, tau z r, tau z z. So, this would be the vectorial form by which you normally write uh, represent your stress tensor. We have assumed theta symmetry so that all the theta dependency is gone. And before I proceed further, I just want you to know that uh, tau r r can be written as 2 mu times the derivative of the velocity component in r direction by r for a Newtonian fluid. And similarly, you can express each of the stress components in terms of some velocity gradients or strains, okay. And uh, if you have a different rheological property, this particular relationship will change. Idea is that I have everything in terms of velocity now and we will be in a position and my differential equation also has velocity, my boundary condition also is going to be in the form of velocity, so everything is consistent, okay. Now, I want to evaluate this, right. So, now n is how do I go about evaluating? There are two ways by which you can evaluate, both of them are equivalent. So, n dot t dot n is going to be given by my unit vector which is E r minus f prime of E z divided by square root of 1 plus f prime squared dotted with my stress tensor. So, what I am going to do now is I am going to write my stress tensor, just expand it and each of this is going to be associated with a particular unit vector, one representing the outward normal, one representing the direction. 
So, tau RR for example is going to be associated with ER, ER, okay, is a normal component. Tau RZ is going to be associated with ER, EZ. Tau ZR is associated with EZ, ER. And I do not like this, tau ZZ is associated with EZ, EZ. Again, it is dotted with ER minus F prime EZ divided by square root of 1 plus F prime squared. Now, this is what I am saying. When you are solving a problem, you have to be able to write that n dot t dot n in terms of variables which are of interest to you, which could be F prime and the velocity gradients. Okay. How do you evaluate this? I am going to uh, take this dot product first. I am going to take this dot product first. So, this er dotted with this term, when I am doing this, I need to just look at the unit vectors adjacent to the dot. So, I need to take this er with this er. That is going to be unity. Okay, And I have tau rr. So, evaluating the dot on the left, what do I have? Tau rr er, okay. I have tau rz ez because er dotted with this er is going to be unity and I am left with this ez, tau rz stays as it is, tau rz ez. The dot of this er with the other two terms is going to be 0 because it is er dotted with ez which is 0, er dotted with ez. So, these two terms do not contribute. Okay. I am left with this term now. This term minus f prime ez dotted with this term is going to be 0, ez dotted with this term is 0, but ez dotted with this term is going to contribute and I will have minus f prime tau zr er. Okay. And again I have minus f prime tau zz ez. Okay. That is just the dot on the left. The dot on the right is still to be evaluated. So, I am just going to write that as it is. Square and I must remember that is this denominator which is still there. Okay. Now, it is straightforward for you to evaluate this. This ER dotted with this ER is going to give me unity. So, I am left with tau RR. This simplifies to tau RR and then this ER with this ER is going to give me a minus f prime tau rz okay clearly this ez with this er is zero this ez with this er is zero okay so i got two terms here and now i need to worry about tau rz ez with this i have minus f prime what did i do just now tau rr er i did these two right tau rz with f prime. So, I need to do uh, tau zr with this uh, minus f prime tau zr and then I have plus f prime squared tau zz divided by 1 plus f prime squared. The square root and the square root together will combine and give me this. So, basically this is the normal stress balance or a normal stress component. So, when you are actually going to be eval solving an actual problem that n dot t dot n is actually useless 
you need to get this form. This form is what you are going to be using when you are solving a problem whether it is in cylindrical coordinates or in Cartesian coordinates or spherical coordinates. Okay. So, well n dot t dot n is nice to you know put it in a vectorial form when it comes to actually solving this is the guy who is going to be used. So, this is one component supposing you uh, have a problem where you just say that the n dot t dot n from one phase is equal to the n dot t dot n from the other phase all you have to do is evaluate this in both the phases on the surface and equate them and that gives you your boundary condition. Okay. So, if the normal stresses across the interface are equal for instance then evaluate the above on both sides and equate this is the boundary condition what is going to be different on one side of the fluid you will use viscosity of the first fluid mu 1 on the other side you are going to use viscosity of the second fluid mu 2 okay and then uh, you will go back to using this constitutive equation here you will use mu 1 mu 2 and then use it. Okay, so that is basically important when you are actually solving problems because it is this form of the thing which you need and what you would do is you would uh, write the tau's in terms of the velocity gradient. Remember your navier stokes equations are also in terms of velocities. So, you have your unknown velocities, your boundary conditions on velocities, everything is fine. Okay. And it is important to do this because the boundary condition is usually an expression of a physical condition, balancing of normal stresses, balancing of tangential stresses. Okay. So, that is uh, the reason why you need to uh, find the normal component of the stress. There is another way I will just mention what it is and then uh, you can check for yourself that they are indeed equivalent. See um, n dot t dot n can also be evaluated as a uh, using a, a matrix multiplication idea. Approach. At the end of the day, I want to get a scalar, right? I want to get the component in the normal stress. So, what is n? n dot t dot n if I have this as a 1 by 2 vector and I am going I am referring to my specific example which I solved just now t is a 2 by 2 matrix which you saw already okay and n can be written as a transpose and then if I write this n as a 2 by 1 okay you have already calculated n it had an er and ez component so er is the first component ez is the second component. So, if you write this as a vector the two components and the matrix you already know in terms of the tau r r tau r z n you already know again but now write it instead of writing it as a row you write it as a column. So, you get a 2 by 1 okay and if, if you would evaluate this you get a 1 by 1 scalar okay. Now, what I want you to do is whichever way you are comfortable with you are going to use when it comes to actually solving a problem either a matrix multiplication approach or that approach it does not matter you should get the same result. So, you guys can do this and check if you are indeed getting the same result I am not going to do this. So, what I am saying is how would you write the n as er the er component is 1 the ez component is minus f prime okay this is my 1 by 2 and the t is tau rr tau rz tau zr tau zz and now I am going to write the n as a 2 by 1 which is basically 1 and minus f prime ok. I want you to understand that these tau rr's 
is actually sigma because that's because this is a normal component and remember what I did last time was I actually when you did a force balance you write this as sigma. So I should have been careful right at the beginning but since I wasn't I am just mentioning it now okay. So remember the tau RR is actually got the pressure as well as the hydrodynamic contribution. Okay. So, if you remember this is normally written in the form of minus p plus tau r r minus p plus tau z z. Okay. And that is what and what you do is you separate out the p and you get your gradient of p term outside. Yeah. For the component of n, there will be 1 divided by mod of uh, under root of 1 plus f dash square. Yes, plus. I have forgotten that. You are right. So, uh, what I need to do is I must remember what he is saying is uh, I have forgotten the normalization factor square root of 1 plus f prime square and I must remember that there is a scalar which is 1 plus f prime square here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, this is coming from the normalization condition. Okay. I kept telling myself I should use sigma, but uh, I didn't. Just want to do the boundary condition and talk a little bit about the generalization of the boundary condition. Okay, and uh, then we will move on. So, you already seen something like this earlier where we use the Young Laplace law okay and I believe it was done for a cylindrical uh, geometry okay. So, if it has been done for a cylindrical geometry the pressure here let us say is P1 inside the uh, thing as well as and outside it is P2 okay. Now, what you have because of the curvature is there is going to be a pressure difference okay and you have P1 minus P2 is given by sigma divided by R where R is the radius. In fact, what I should do is I should write this as sigma divided by capital R and because the small r actually represents my radial coordinate okay. Now, I just wanted to uh, when I wrote down the boundary condition in the last class what I did was I just uh, told you that n dot t dot n in the first uh, fluid or was it the second fluid minus n dot t dot n in the first fluid equals sigma times del dot n. This is the most general form of the boundary condition. I want to basically show that this particular condition that was derived last time using a work energy principle in terms of you know how much of energy is stored in the on the interface when you change it by dr, uh, how, what is the work done by, and by equating that that is how you got this relationship. So, rather than do a formal uh, derivation of this which we will do later on in the course. I just want to show that this is basically a generalization of this and the way I am going to do this is evaluate each of these terms and show that it collapses to this and remember the way that n is defined, n is defined as um, outward normal from 1 to 2. That is the direction. So, what is the direction of n? This is n. n happens to be equal to er because it is in the radial direction, okay. n is er. And our job now is to calculate del dot n for this interface. So, what is the gradient operator? 
the gradient operator in cylindrical coordinates is er plus er by r plus d by dz of ez. All I have to do is get del dot n, which means I must do the dot product of this with er. er dotted with er is unity. When I differentiate unity, I get 0. So, this guy is not going to contribute. er dotted with er is unity. This r remains. So, I get a 1 by r term here. And I am going to be evaluating it on the boundary, remember. So, therefore, it is going to be 1 by capital R. And ez dotted with er is going to be 0. Okay. So, all I am trying to show here is that del dot n reduces to 1 by r for this problem. And if you had a more complicated shape, rather than you know worry about the interface, you would just do del dot n. And possibly in your calculus courses, you have already seen that del dot n indeed represents the curvature. So, that is the idea here that uh, del dot n, del dot n is nothing but del dot er and that is equal to 1 by r. And on the interface, we have 1 by capital R because you are evaluating the boundary condition on the surface. So, r is equal to capital R. Okay. What about the guys on the left, n dot t dot n? Now, t, now I am going to be careful. How do I write t? I am going to make sure I do not make this mistake I made last time. Sigma rr tau rz tau zr and sigma zz. Okay. Just to tell you that in the normal uh, direction, we are, were using sigma to represent the total component and now I am going to break this up in terms of the pressure and that due to the flow. Okay. And so, now I am going to write this as minus p plus tau rr and this is what I should have done last time minus p plus tau zz. Okay. So, since we are talking about see, our objective remember is to derive the Young Laplace law from this generalized boundary condition. This generalized boundary condition basically includes the effect of the flow as well. Now, we are, in the case of a static situation, the only thing that is going to contribute is going to be the pressure terms in the diagonal element. Okay. These guys are going to be 0 because there is no velocity. And if you were to now evaluate n dot t dot n using whatever we did earlier, you will find that this is going to basically boil down to just the pressure term. Yeah. So, when I were, if I were to substitute this particular form for the uh, tensor t here and what evaluate n dot t dot n using the method that I just discussed earlier, what you will get is minus of p 2 coming from the first term and you will get minus of minus p 1 plus p 1 coming and that is something which I want you to do. Okay? I want you to find out that this basically boils down to sigma divided by capital R. Okay? The, um, on substituting all this, on substituting, That is what we get. This is for the case when the fluids are at rest. So, what I want you to do clearly is do the spherical analog. The spherical analog use the generalized formulation of this boundary condition and do it for a sphere and see what you get. Okay? 
and uh, the relationship of course is classical, but I just want you to derive it this way, just so that you get comfortable with this whole business of evaluating the boundary conditions starting from this point. Okay. Yep. Now, if you have a complicated surface wherein we define it by f of capital F of r comma z, then we'll be we should be careful with del f, right? We can express it in the other way also, the negative of that. Yeah, then that's the reason I wanted to be explicit. If you want to define it from two to one, then you will flip the things on the left hand side. You would. How do we make sure of that uh, when we define a capital F of uh, r comma z? You have to make sure of that by looking at the way you are defining the coordinate system. So I think the question is how do you make sure that the uh, outward normal is pointing from 1 to 2, okay. The definition of the outward normal is depending upon the way we have defined the surface in the sense I am going to write it as r is equal to f of z or z is equal to f of x. So you are looking at when you write it as r is equal to f of z, you are going in the radial direction. So, the, as you are going uh, in, in the direction of increasing r, you are going from 1 to 2, that is the idea, okay. So, I think uh, if you are going in the other direction, it would be in the uh, direction of minus n because n was equal to so the way I defined it, n was in the r direction. As I was going in the direction of n, I went from 1 to 2. This is going in the direction of the radius. If I were to go come in the negative r direction then n would be automatically minus of er, okay, and then you are coming from 2 to 1. So, the, I think the best thing to do is to just make sure that you are going in one direction and calculate the uh, normal and look at the uh, sign, okay. I think when we do a couple of problems, it will become clear. Okay, so I think we what we have done is we have actually established the framework in the sense we got the boundary conditions, we have got the uh, differential equations and since this uh, course is basically on uh, analytical methods, so we will now talk about uh, using some analytical methods and the basic concept is using a perturbation theory approach. Now here what is important is sometime back you had some couple of lectures on scaling, right. You transformed your equations in terms of dimensionless variables, you had Reynolds numbers, you had uh, different kinds of uh, dimensionless groups which came up and uh, under some conditions these dimensionless numbers can have different orders of magnitude. So for example, if your flow, uh, flow is highly viscous, okay, then the Reynolds number is going to be very low and if the Reynolds number is very low, you can drop the inertial terms because the inertial forces are low. You can make a simplification. So in the limit of Reynolds number equal to 0, you can possibly get a solution. Now the question that arises is, supposing Reynolds number is not 0, but it is small but finite, you want to get a better approximation to the solution, how would you go about doing that, okay. So what we want to do is we want to be able to um, get some insight about a behavior of a system which in this case happens to be a flow problem by looking at uh, regimes where some parameters could be small. So, can I exploit the fact that some parameters are small to uh, get some analytical solution, okay. I am going to illustrate this idea with a very simple problem now and then later on we will solve this thing with uh, an actual flow problem. So, let us take a very, so idea is we do a scaling, okay, of the equations and maybe some parameters are small. For instance, um, if 
the viscosity is high, then Reynolds number tends to 0. Okay, Reynolds number is low. And can I actually use the fact that Reynolds number is low to get a solution? So, one thing you can do is we can put Reynolds number equal to 0 and find a solution. Now, why do I say that? Because when I put Reynolds number equal to 0, the left hand side basically contains the nonlinear terms. Okay, all I have on the right hand side are my pressure gradient and my viscous forces. So, that is a linear system and I should be able to solve it. But the question is, is the solution valid for finite RE? Can I use the information that I have a uh, solution for RE equal to 0 and how can I use this information to make a correction and find the solution for a finite value of Reynolds number which is small? Okay, that is the idea. Okay. So, this for low RE, can we uh, make a correction okay, and get an improved estimate? of the solution okay because maybe and if i can get an improved estimate of the solution then i'm more confident rather than use the solution r equal to 0 for r equal to 10 or r equal to 100 i would rather use this improved estimate to find out what my flow is when r is 10 or 100 okay so how do you go about doing that so we will take a very simple problem first to illustrate the idea and then we will uh, go back to solving uh, fluid flow problems. Okay. So, remember one of the important things when you are using perturbation theory is you have to do the scaling, you have to make things dimensionless and you had a couple of lectures earlier on how to make things dimensionless. So, depending upon the values of those parameters, some parameter may be large, some parameter may be small. If a parameter is large, you can treat the reciprocal of that as a small parameter. If a parameter is low, then you can use it as it is. Okay? So, let us just look at a very simple problem, just an algebraic equation. So, consider the algebraic equation x squared minus 1 equals 0. Okay. So, everybody knows how to solve this. You may possibly did this in high school and you know what the solutions are. x equals plus or minus 1. Okay. Consider now a modified problem. Consider a problem x squared minus epsilon x minus 1 equals 0. What I have done, this is of course a fictitious mathematical problem. Okay, I want to just illustrate the ideas on a fictitious mathematical problem. Then you can go back and do your fluid flow problems where you can apply things. This epsilon is a small parameter. Okay, and uh, here again, so epsilon is a small parameter. And do you know the solution to this equation? Of course, you know the solution to this equation also. This x, the two roots, the solutions to this equation is given by minus b plus or minus square root of b squared. That is it. So, in this case, of course, 
although you had a small problem, is this okay? In this case, of course, since the problem was simple, you already know the solution. But supposing you do not know a formula, supposing this equation has been a cubic or a fourth order equation which contains this, maybe you do not have an explicit relationship. Okay? In fact, uh, if you have up till the fourth order, fifth order, you do have explicit relationships, but we do not uh, worry about this. But now the question that I want to uh, ask here is, for the case where epsilon is 0, I know what my solutions are. Okay? And is it possible for me to find out the solutions for this equation as, because for small values of epsilon, I expect that my roots are going to be only slightly different from the uh, case where epsilon is 0. So, when epsilon equal to 0, I have 2 roots plus or minus 1. When epsilon is small, maybe 10 power minus 5, 10 to the negative 6, okay? I do not expect that to be a very significant change. There would be a change, but maybe not a very significant change. So, can I look at, at the variable x as a function of epsilon and look at it as a ta do a Taylor series expansion or do a power series expansion and seek the solution of x in terms of epsilon as a power series. Okay? So, that is the idea. So, for small uh, values of epsilon, small epsilon, we expect the solutions to be close to plus minus 1. So, small changes in epsilon gave me small changes in x. Okay? Give small changes in x, the solution. So, can we do a Taylor series expansion or a power series expansion? So, we seek x as a power series in epsilon. So, clearly you all understand that x depends upon the value of epsilon. Okay? We do not know what that function is, but what we will do is instead of writing it as f of x, we normally write it as a power series expansion. I am going to write the power series expansion about a point which I already know. When epsilon is 0, x is plus or minus 1. Okay? So, that is the idea when we are doing this perturbation series. So, we seek x as x0 plus x1 epsilon plus x2 epsilon squared, etc. Okay? So, the idea is I, x is a function of epsilon. Okay? This is an approximation to x which is a function of epsilon. Clearly, different values of epsilon give you different values of x. So, x depends on epsilon and the functional dependency is written in this form. What is x0, x1, x2? These are going to be numbers. These are going to be constants. And if you can actually calculate what x0, x1, x2 are, you can actually calculate what x is as a function of epsilon. Okay? So, x0, in this particular problem, it is very simple. So, x0, x1, x2 are numbers or scalars okay, and if we can find these we know x as a function of epsilon. Okay? So, what are the arbitrary function? The function is given right there in terms of the square root sign. I am just going to write it in terms of a Taylor series or a power series. So, how do we go about finding x0, x1, x2? So, if x is going to be in this form, clearly x must satisfy my algebraic equation which I had. So, I am going to substitute this particular form of x in the original equation and I am going to invoke the fact that this particular thing has to be satisfied for every epsilon, okay, for any arbitrary epsilon. What that means is I would get something like a power series and we will be equating terms of the same order of epsilon. 
All the terms that have ordered epsilon to the power 0, I group. Epsilon to the power 1, I group. Epsilon squared, I group. Okay? And that is the general approach. So, what we do is we substitute this in that particular form that x is squared minus epsilon x. So, substitute this in the quadratic and what do you get? Whole squared minus epsilon multiplied by x2 minus 1 equals 0. Okay. I need x to satisfy the equation. So, this particular form has to satisfy that equation. I am just substituting it here. And now, you just need to expand all this and uh, see what you get. So, to expand the, the quadratic term, the square term, I get x naught squared plus 2 epsilon x naught x 1 okay, plus um, a square plus 2. I know all other terms will have uh, this thing plus my epsilon squared term which is going to arise from 2 x 2 x 0 plus x 1 squared plus higher order terms which I am going to neglect. What I have done is I am just writing terms up till order epsilon squared. Okay? This is going to be coming from my x 0 squared plus 2 this and then some of you must tell me if this is right or not. Okay, then I have the other term which is minus epsilon times the same thing x2 minus 1 equals 0. I am going to now, I want this equation, these terms to be valid for any epsilon, for any choice of epsilon, I want this to be valid. Okay, so what I am going to do is I am going to equate terms since. We want this to be valid for any epsilon. We equate powers of the order of epsilon to the power n. Okay, so I am going to group the terms that are of order epsilon to the power 0. So, which are the terms which are independent of epsilon? It is just x naught squared and minus 1. This must be equal to 0. Okay? That is what it gives me. And which gives me x naught is plus or minus 1. What about order epsilon to the power 1? I have a term here 2 x 0 x 1. Okay, all these are higher order terms. I have one guy here minus x naught equal to 0. Okay, this gives me x 0 is already found out. So, this implies x1 is half. Okay? And you can similarly calculate x2 by looking at the term which is of order epsilon squared. So, now we look at the uh, next term, the second order term and uh, at order epsilon squared the uh, equation which uh, has to be satisfied is 2 times x2 x0 plus x1 squared minus x1 equals 0. 
and uh, we already know x0 and x1 and so what I can do is I can use this to find out x2. In fact, we know that x0 is plus or minus 1 and x1 is half. So what this gives me is when I substitute these values I get 1 by 4th here. So I get 2 times x2 times x0 plus 1 4th minus half equals 0 which implies that x2 is equal to half minus 1 4th, 1 4th divided by 2 1 8 1 8 of x0. Remember x0 can take plus or minus 1 as two values. So when x0 equals plus 1, I have x2 equals 1 by 8 and when x0 for x0 equals minus 1, we have x2 equals minus 1 by 8. And now since I know x0, x1 and x2, I can substitute the values in my power series and this gives me the two expressions x as being plus 1 plus half of epsilon where x1 is plus half and x2 is plus 1 by 8 of epsilon squared plus etc. And the other root gives me minus 1 plus half of epsilon minus epsilon squared divided by 8 plus etc. So these are the power series expressions for x in terms of epsilon which we have obtained using the perturbation series method. And depending on the level of accuracy that you want, you would take you know higher order terms uh, should you be more interested in getting more accurate values. So when epsilon is 0, I get back plus or minus 1 which are my roots. My first order correction is the same for both but my second order correction has a different sign. So x uh, was given by epsilon plus or minus square root of epsilon squared plus 4 divided by 2. Now this can be expanded in the form of a binomial series, right? And you know how it is epsilon squared plus 4 to the power half. You can uh, factor things out and you can do this. I want you to do that and uh, see if it boils down to this expression that we have and then you will get a better feel for what exactly is going on. So one way to uh, do an approximation to uh, this particular exact solution is to do a binomial series expansion, take a few terms in epsilon. The other way is to do what we did which is just assume a power series expansion and you get the solution and uh, you know when you see that both of them are equal which is how they should be then you are convinced that things are working fine. There are of course some limitations to this. There are times when this method is not going to work okay? and uh, those are things we will see as we go along. Um, one particular book which deals extensively with perturbation series expansion is authored by Nefe and I would uh, you know, recommend those of you who are interested in understanding this a bit more deeply, uh, th this is a good book for perturbation expansions. So what I have done today is just given you an idea about how this perturbation method works and what you will do is when any problem where you have a small parameter, you can actually go about um, exploiting the existence of the small parameter and finding solutions.